Well, good morning, Christ Church. Look at this crowd here this morning. It's good to see you all here today. My name is Don. I'm the worship pastor here at the church, and I want to welcome you. Everybody joining us online, thank you for being a part of this service this morning. Please take a moment to go and fill out that online connect card so we can get to know you better. We've got a couple of announcements that I want to bring to your attention as we get ready to start today. We are going to be renovating our sanctuary over the next couple years, and we have a special information meeting today at 2 o'clock. Here in the sanctuary, if you want to get to know what all we're doing, come on out at 2 o'clock. We'd love to share with you the plans for the renovation. Out in Scripture Hall, there is a table for our Awana program. It's a club for kids that learn to learn uh, memory to Bible verses and commit them to memory. And that program starts this fall. You can go out and check that table and get your kids signed up for that. Also, if you're an educator involved in education anyway, we have a special gift bag for you at Creation Clubhouse check-in center. We'd love for you to get that as you get ready to start the school this year. If you're an educator, please do so. Let's go to God in prayer as we get ready to worship him this morning. Father, we have gathered here in your house. We've come before you, Lord. May we just leave all of our burdens at the door. May we bring all our cares to your altar, Lord. May we just lay them down at your feet as we praise you and as we give you thanks for your one and only son, Jesus Christ. We ask all this in his name. Amen. Come on, church, let's stand together in the Father's house today and worship Him. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does A Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does Oh, lay your burdens down
Louder than the unbelief Come on, sing that with me this morning I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me The King is alive. Let's prepare to give him our tithes and offerings this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. Almighty God, you are alive. Your presence is with us today. And now we turn our attention to the giving of your tithes and offerings. We pray your blessings upon these gifts. As you've given them blessings to us, Lord, we pray that you will bless them for your use. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may give here at the bowls in the front, in the back. There's also some in the balcony. Of course, you can always give online at mychristchurch.com slash give. We're going to learn a new song this morning. I think you're going to pick it up very quickly. So when you feel ready, join us as we sing together.
Holy Spirit, you were the same Spirit then that filled the upper room when the disciples were there at Pentecost, Lord. We pray you fill this room now, just as you did then. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill this place. Do incredible things here, Lord. Open our hearts to the word you have for us today. Speak to us, Lord. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 7. Let's read this together responsively. 
God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. God is an honest judge. He is angry with the wicked every day. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. If a person does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He will bend and string his bow. He will prepare his deadly weapons and shoot his flaming arrows. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. The wicked conceive evil. They are pregnant with trouble and give birth to lies. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. They dig a deep pit to trap others, then fall into it themselves. The trouble they make for others backfires on them. The violence they plan falls on their own heads. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Church, let's greet one another and then you may be seated. time. Hey, it's back to school time, and it is a part of our rhythm here to have a special prayer for all of our educators, our educational support staff, our administrators, anybody that has to do with education. I'd just like for you guys to stand now. We would just like to hold you up in prayer. Would all of our educators and support staff please stand? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Almighty God, thank you for those that you have called into this incredibly important vocation. Thank you, dear God, for those who give of their lives, their talents, their abilities to pour into people like us. As I think back, I am so incredibly grateful to the great teachers that I had. I'm so incredibly grateful for the people who work so hard to to make education happen in a way that truly impacted my life. And I thank you for these Christian men and women that you have called to stand tall, to offer of themselves to this incredible, incredible endeavor. Protect them, give them strength, good courage and dreams and visions. In Jesus' strong name, amen. Thank you all for what you do. One other thing on the education side, Christian education. When I was a boy, I went to public schools my whole life, except for seventh grade, but I was a part of the public school system. But one of the things that was really really emphasized in my life was memorizing scriptures when I was a kid. And I was incentivized. I mean, you got Reese's peanut butter cups and various things if you uh, successfully memorize scriptures. And you say, well, did that impact your life a lot then? No. I mean, Reese's peanut butter cups were cool. But did it impact my life a lot then? No. But it impacts my life every single day now. I want to suggest to you the most important thing you can do with your children and grandchildren is to make sure that they have some scripture inside of them. Every scripture they learn is an arrow in their quiver. And when life gets hard and when they have challenges in front of them, they can reach back and get those arrows and fire them. That's what scripture does. It equips our children to be effective Christian adults. You know, we spend a lot of time working with our kids to learn sports and various other things. And you know what? I'll be real honest with you about all that. I hope your kid goes pro. 
I hope your kid signs a $500 million contract, and I hope your kid tithes to Christ Church. I'm going to be real honest with you there, real honest with you there. But I am going to tell you this. I don't know that that's gonna happen, but I do know this, your child will grow up to be a man or a woman, and we have some say as to whether or not they are equipped to be men and women of God. Let's equip them. So right outside, we have Awana. Awana is a ministry that just gets scripture inside of kids. They would love to tell you about their ministry. Uh, It is one great opportunity to do what I'm talking about, and I pray God's blessing upon it. One of my favorite sayings is just because you think everybody's out to get you doesn't mean that everybody isn't actually out to get you. (laughs) Obviously, there's some hyperbole baked into all this, but we all have times when life just gives us an old-fashioned whooping. Sometimes the overwhelming obstacles are self-inflicted. Sometimes they're caused by the bad decisions of people that we love. But sometimes they just come our way for no reason at all. It's the cost of doing business in a fallen world. To make matters worse, if you're prone to anxiety, something doesn't even need to happen to throw you off. Just thinking about what could happen can throw you into a spiral. Difficult seasons come to everybody. They're just a part of what it means to be a human being in this present age. I just want you to know, you can do everything right and things will still go wrong. Now, you can do everything wrong, and I guarantee a lot more is going to go wrong. But you can do everything right and stuff will still go wrong. None of us look forward to these downward spirals, these difficult stretch of highway. But I think most of us can testify that God often works especially in our lives during these unwanted seasons of trial. Why? I think it's because we're especially open to God when things are bad. And I think it's because we're especially honest before God when things are bad. Psalm 7 encourages us to rethink our mindsets when our inner worlds are threatening to blow apart. Psalm 7 is a path out of anxiety. I believe the Bible to be an incredibly practical book. Uh, 66 books written over a span of hundreds of years, various authors all pointing to the same theme. And I believe there are practical pieces in the Bible that if we follow those pieces, we're going to end up in a good place. Imagine that you are going on a cross-country hike. You're out in the middle of nowhere. You're not going to see anybody, and there's not a lot of signs. But somebody hands you a map. Now, if you choose not to follow that map, you can't really blame the map maker. God has given us a map, Scripture. And if we follow it, we'll get where God wants us to be and where we want to be. We ignore it to our own peril. So the question before us in this series is how do you keep a smile on your face, a song in your heart, some pep in your step when your mind is running away from you? I think learning to say and to stay up in the down seasons is a necessary soul skill. And if we're going to live soul salsa lives, upbeat Christian lives, we not only have to learn how to ride it when everything's going our way, we have to learn how to navigate it when things are going poorly. We have to learn to navigate through the storms, especially, especially when anxiety sets in. So for the purpose of this series, we're engaging in five definitions. I invite you to read them with me. Soul, the essence of every human being. Salsa, an upbeat, exciting, and dynamic, attractive life. Church, an exciting place where lives are transformed. Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, filled with spirit, passion, creativity, and life. And ministry, the heart-pounding, dynamic work we do as the physical presence of Jesus Christ. My job this summer is to equip you to live that. And the Psalms 
are an invaluable tool in equipping us to do just that. One of my favorite parables of Jesus that I always think of in turbulent times is the parable of the two houses. You remember the parable? There are two houses, seemingly identical, but they are built on different foundations. Jesus said one of the houses is built on sand. In Israel, that would be a wadi. A wadi is an ancient riverbed. It's, it's nice and flat, and there's not a lot of stuff there. And it's a real easy place to build a house. The other is built on a rock. Building on a rock is a lot harder because you've got to get that rock flat. You've got a lot of work before you even start building your house. And then Jesus said, and then the storms came. The wadi turned into a flash flood, swept one house away. The other house that was built on the rock stood. So what's the theme? The theme is if we hear and obey the teachings of Christ, we are like a house built on the rock. And when the difficult times in life come our way, and they will, that we will remain standing. What's the sub-theme? No matter where you build your house, storms are going to come. And I just want you to hear that. No matter where you build your house, storms are going to come. There is some really bad theology out there today that says if we build our house in the right place, the storms won't hit. And that'll trip you up eight days a week. Storms come to everyone. So when you think about the storms in life, and, and maybe there's a storm just blowing in your soul right now. If you're in the middle of a storm, or, or maybe you're just afraid of storms, this psalm has some real hope for us. It has some real help for us. Today's psalm is a prayer of protection from a king who's caught in the storm. And what you get the feeling with David is some of that storm is external, but some of that storm is internal. When we face challenges, there are external challenges, but there's also internal pressure that often takes the form of anxiety and can go a million directions from there. This is a path out of that. You guys ever been driving and you were suddenly caught in a storm that was so intense that visibility just got to be zero and clearly it wasn't safe to travel? Uh, people who stay on the road on these occasions really put themselves and others in some pretty cataclysmic situations or potentially cataclysmic situations. All of these multi-car accidents that you often see, so many of them are, are caused by people who are just continuing to drive when driving conditions are completely unsafe, whether it be a, a blizzard or a rainstorm or a hailstorm. It's just to keep driving when conditions are unsafe puts you and everyone else in danger. The prudent thing to do when these things happen is just pull off, find a safe place to pull off Sit in your car and just wait for things to improve. And they normally do. But the worst thing you can do is speed up. The worst thing you can do is say, I'm, I'm just going to outrun this somehow and go 100 miles an hour into zero visibility. There's nothing but bad things waiting for you. One thing I like about David, and there are a lot of things about David that you wouldn't want to emulate, but his heart for God is something we can learn from. And one thing I like about David is when times get bad, he never speeds up. He always slows down. And what you're gonna get today is a six-step navigational tool to help us move out of anxiety. Now, there's a few lists in this message, and I'll kind of tell you the big ones and the small ones, but this is number one of the big ones. Go to God. When times are blowing up, Go to God. I'm going to encourage you to write these down and, and to play them out. Because unless we apply this stuff, it's not going to help us. Go to God. Verses 1 and 2. Psalm, a psalm of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush of the tribe of Benjamin. I come to you for protection, O God. Save me from my persecutors. Rescue me. If you don't, they will maul me like a lion. 
tearing me to pieces with no one to rescue me. David saw himself as a sheep who was trying to avoid being destroyed by a dangerous predator. You know, David is an absolute monarch. Clearly, he had the power to execute his enemies. But David has a pragmatic side. He knows that if you lose the support of your people, you're gonna have nobody to rule. So what David is in is a little bit of a conundrum here. If he acts against Cush, he puts his throne in jeopardy. If he doesn't act, his life is in jeopardy. We don't know a thing about Cush, the Benjaminite. We just don't know a thing about him. But we can infer a couple of things. First of all, we can infer that he is enfranchised, and we can infer that he's powerful. Otherwise, he would be no threat to David at all. So whatever Cush is representing, whether it be real or inside David's head, he is a substantial threat to the well-being of the king. The other thing about Cush is that his weapons of choice seem to be slander. Seems to be slander. Cush seems to know that swords and spears and arrows... Uh, you can have a defense against those. Slander, it's really hard to defend. When people just speak lies, they're very, very difficult to counter, especially once it all gets out. Cush's accusations are beyond David's political reach to silence. And there's a storm brewing. And David needs to exercise caution. Uh, it's getting dangerous to travel. It's time to pull off the road. Well, one thing we know about Israel, it's a fledgling monarchy. There are only two kings in. They've already changed dynasties once from Saul to David. So Israel is at risk. The monarchy is at risk. David is at risk. Everybody here is vulnerable. The nation God formed to one day bring salvation to the world is under threat. Where do you go when there's nowhere else to go? Where do you go when you have anxiety that you cannot control and you've worn everybody else out that knows and loves you with it? You've done everything you know to do and still it remains. Where do you go? David went to the Lord. A lot of times I think and I'm concerned that we go to God last. And I just want to suggest to you, we should go to God first. He should be our first stop. Number two, this is a big number two. Examine your heart. Verses three through five. Oh Lord, my God, if I've done anything wrong or if I'm guilty of injustice, if I've been betrayed by a friend or plundered my enemy without cause, let my enemies capture me. Let them trample me in the ground. Let my honor be left in the dust. The Hebrew here, and the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the Hebrew here suggests that David believes he is completely innocent of this charge. Whatever this matter is, David believes that he is completely right. Cush the Benjaminite, on the other hand, believes that David is completely wrong. We have two opinions, and they're not going to be resolved. They're not going to be mediated. Cush wants to destroy the king because he thinks the king is evil. David is convinced he is completely in the right. And in this situation, God is going to have to decide. There are times when it feels like you died and went back to an old Dave Mason song. There ain't no good guy. There ain't no bad guy. There's only you and me and we just disagree. That's a best case scenario here. But they're not going to be able to work this out. And David says to God, you be the judge. But David makes a pretty bold prayer here. He says, God, if I'm wrong, let them have me. If I'm wrong, let them have me. Third, make a petition to God. Make a petition to God. You've, you've gone to God. You've examined your heart. So now make your petition. Tell God what it is that's on your heart. Verse six, arise, O Lord, in anger. Stand up against the fury of my enemies. Wake up, my God, and bring justice. Remember, justice? Justice is what we want for others. What do we want for ourselves? Mercy, right? 
So David is convinced that he has been wrong, so he is praying justice for others. Gather the nations before you. Sit on your throne high above them. The Lord passes judgment on the nations. Declare me righteous, O Lord, for I am innocent, Lord most high. End the wickedness of the ungodly, but help all those who obey you. For you look deep within the mind and heart, O righteous God. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. God is a judge who is perfectly fair. He is angry with the wicked every day. If a person does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He will bend the string of his bow. He will prepare his deadly weapons and ignite flaming arrows. That's kind of a pile on. It's a pile on. It's one thing to shoot arrows. It's something else to light them. This is God's vengeance. So what are the petitions? The petitions are for God's intervention in his situation. David is convinced he's right. He said, if I'm wrong, let them have me. But if I'm right... You need to defend me. What are the prayers? Number one, arise in anger, oh God. Arise in anger at injustice. Number two, stand up against their fury. They are coming at me hard. They are radiating at high frequencies. I can't stop them. Lord, you stand against them. Number three, wake up and bring justice. Wake up and bring justice. Melissa and I have a couple of rescue dogs. Our oldest dog, Buffy, is somewhere between 12 and 200 years old. <laughs> Her love language is knowing that she is surrounded by people who care about her and sleep in 22 hours a day. She wakes up to eat, and there's only one time that Buff is stressed, and that is when Melissa and I are outside, and she is inside, and she can see us. And I mean, she's stressed bad. Well, every morning at six, Melissa and I go out for coffee, and we usually sit right outside, and a lot of times, first thing in the morning, you know, uh, we're just there by ourselves. The dogs are eating and doing whatever they do in the morning, and then Buff will get noticing that we're not there. She walks up to the window, and she sees us, and the first thing she does is start slapping the door with her paw, and she's big. She's a big dog. She slaps the, the, the window and the door with her paw. And then she starts making this pathetic noise. Hmm, 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 hmm. And then she starts barking. She just starts barking. It's kind of like she's saying, guys, why would you even get a rescue dog if you don't want me with you while you're having coffee? If you don't want to spend every second of your life with me, why would you even get a rescue dog? Whack, whack, whack. And guess what we always do? We let her out. And guess what she does? She takes three steps and plops on the ground, sleeps the whole time. She just wants to get our attention. Arise. Oh, Lord, wake up. Bring justice. Dear God, I'm here You've been hurting really, really bad. Just wonder if anybody saw you, if anybody cared. David is just sending out an SOS to God. God. Number four, he says, gather the nations against them. There's an alliance coming at David. David says, Lord, you're just going to have to form the alliance against the enemies. I, I can't do it on my own. I'm not strong enough. You've been up against something You're just not strong enough on your own. You know, it could have to do with a thousand things. It could have to do with disease. It could have to do with a financial situation. It could have to do with relational things. That list goes on and on and on. But whatever it is, you you can't stand up against it alone. David's saying, Lord, line up the nations to stand against them. And then number five, rule over them. God, would you be God on my behalf? And then we get to the fourth big one. Anticipate intervention. A part of learning to live a soul to life is to begin celebrating the victory even before the victory has arrived. We live in joyous anticipation of the great about to be. And let me kind of help you with this because a lot of times I think we as Christians get a little stuck in time and space. 
We, we get a little stuck thinking that the span of our lives are, are the time we spend on earth. The Bible has an eternal perspective for humans. The Bible talks about an eternal peace with us. We call it our soul, but a peace that is eternal. Let me tell you how that ends for Christians. The eternal part of us, the part that really, really matters. Let me tell you how that ends for Christians. We spend eternity with God. It ends really well. How do things end in this world? Probably not as well. But we're going to something better. That's why Christians, even in the most difficult times in life, even when there may not be any hope in this world, can still have a song in their heart because we know that this world is not the whole of our existence. We will spend eternity with God. And we really need to keep that in mind. We need to anticipate godly intervention. So what happens when God intervenes, all right? You know, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So somebody's coming at you. Our temptation is always to try to extract revenge on them. That just is gonna get you in a mess, right? Somebody says something, you say something back, they say something, and all for long, you just got, you know, uh, tropical storm stupid, just kind of rolling all over the place, right? So, so let God handle this. So what does God do? When God intervenes, the wicked are judged. Verse seven, the wicked are judged. David said, look into the heart of my accuser. Declare them guilty. Stop what they're doing before they even get the chance to do it. Lord, preemptive, be preemptive in your strike upon my enemies. Next, the righteous are declared innocent. Lord, vindicate me. Did you know there's a strong element of vindication throughout Bible, but particularly in the Psalms? Remember the 23rd Psalm, the most familiar of all, has that piece at the end, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The 23rd Psalm has a how do you like me now piece to it. It has a how do you like me now piece. You may be beating the daylights out of me, but I'm gonna stay faithful to God and there will be a day when God not only saves me, but when God vindicates me and you, my friend, are gonna get to watch. You say, well, that's a little mean. Take it up with God. It's right there in the Psalms. (laughs) Number three, true motives are revealed, verse nine. One of the things I often pray is, Lord, help me see what's truly there. You ever had to have a talk with yourself because your mind's getting away from you? You ever just had to set yourself down and have a talk? That's really what this is. It says, Lord, uh, reveal the true motives. Help me to see what's there, not just what I think. You know, a lot of times it seems like a whole mountain's in front of us, and a whole mountain's not in front of us. It's just a matter of perspective. I use this illustration all the time because it's so easy and it, it's attached to me, but you look at my fist, it's the size of a fist, right? Boom. It's just that size, unless, of course, it's right here. From my perspective, this fist is the single largest thing in the cosmos. It's all I can see. Well, that's what happens when trouble gets up on us. It gets so close, it's all that we can see. And this is a prayer of God. Reveal things for how they truly are. You know what I found over the years? If I think I got a mountain in front of me, I could just chop that thing up to pieces and just address a piece at a time. And before long, you start getting a little bit of distance. And I think that's what God gives us. The Bible talks how God gives us space sometimes in difficult things. I always think of that as perspective. Just, just kind of get the fist away from me a little bit. Give me a little perspective. True motives are revealed. Verse uh, next in, in verse 10, God stands between the righteous and the evil. It says, you are my shield who saves me. When life is going good, you're on offense. Swords, arrows, spears. When life's going bad, you're on defense. You are in live to fight another day mode if you're lucky. When the Bible says that God is my shield, that means everything's coming at us. We can find protection beneath the shield of God. Then it says in verse 11, God's anger is stirred. You are a judge who's wicked, who's angry at the wicked every day. 
God loves people, but God hates wickedness. He said, isn't hate a little bit strong? No. It's the word that's there. God hates wickedness. God loves people. God hates wickedness. God can't tolerate it. It is impossible for God to tolerate wickedness in his presence. They are mutually exclusive realms of existence. Where there is one, there will not be the other. Where there is godliness, there will not be wickedness. Where there is wickedness, there can be no godliness. God is not tolerant toward wickedness. His anger is stirred. And then verse 12 says, and then God goes on the offensive. He arms himself against the wicked with flaming arrows. God fights for us. Isn't that incredible? When we don't have the strength to fight for ourselves, God fights for us. When I was in sixth grade, we moved to San Antonio, Texas. We did not live in the world's greatest of neighborhoods. And I attended a school that, uh, I was just a country kid from Southern Illinois. And uh, I attended a school that was rough. And I was only scared to go to school Monday through Friday. Weekends, I was great. And I got looking around, just kind of thinking about how to survive. And there was this kid who was six foot one. He didn't have a lot of friends, but he was huge. And I thought, Captain, you're about to get a new best friend. (laughs) You know what? He really did end up being a good friend. But he also probably kept a lot of bad things off of me. If somebody picked on me, they're going to have to deal with him. If you're godly, if you're standing for God, somebody picks on you, they're going to have to deal with God. Not you. You're going to have to deal with God. I had a situation many, many years ago. I was walking into church, and pretty narrow. It wasn't here. It was in another place. And I was walking pre- pretty narrow aisleway. This great big guy stops me, and, and you could tell he was agitated. You ever, you ever just run into somebody, got right in your grill, and you could tell they were angry? This was that. So I always assessed the situation first. He was way bigger than me and way stronger than me. And I thought, this could get bad. And then I looked at him. I thought, I can outrun him. We're good. (laughs) We're good. He looked at me and he said, preacher, I feel like I have the only profession in the world where people often refer to you by your vocation as if it were your first name. But it happens a lot. He said, preacher. I've been saying a lot of bad things about you. I've not been real happy with some decisions that this church has made. And I've been running you down all over town. And I feel bad about it, and I just want you to know it. I said, well, Captain, I wouldn't worry about me. I said, I I don't always get things right, but I can tell you that every decision I've made and every decision the church made, we tried to get it right. We tried to hear God on it, and I feel like that we've made the right decisions. So uh, don't worry about me. God will protect me. And then I looked at him and I said, but if I was you, I'd be worried about myself. Because uh, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But if I'm right, you're fighting God, not me. I have no idea who's going to protect you, Captain. God protects the righteous. And then I love this next one because there's so much hope in this. Even the wicked, verse 12, it says, the wicked have an opportunity to repent. Even the wicked, the worst people out there have an opportunity to repent. And some of you can give testimony to that today because at one point in your life, you were the worst person out there. And God has saved you. God has redeemed you. God has turned your life around. You see, we Bible-believing Christians, we believe God can actually change people. And some of you are witnesses to that. You've got more mistakes in your background than you can remember, but God has washed them as far away as the east is from the west. He has turned your life around, and you are a godly man or a godly woman today, and all of the glory goes to God. Even the worst People out there have an opportunity to repent. And that's part of the good news we share. Until, of course, they don't. Right? We don't have forever to repent. When Christ comes back, the buzzer sounds. When we die, the buzzer sounds. There is a window to repent 
And for all of us living folks, the window's going like this, not like that. Maybe you've been thinking you need to turn to God. I, I just want to tell you, you can turn to God anytime uh, until you can't, until you can't. We were gonna play a fall softball this year. We we're gonna put a father-son team together. We had some enthusiasm about it that kind of kind of increased or decreased based on age. And uh, we were gonna do this. So we contacted the uh, O'Fallon Softball League for the fall. And guess what we found out? We could have applied any time, but we missed the deadline. So we could have applied any time until we couldn't. You can repent anytime until you can't. The people you love can turn to Jesus anytime until they can't. One of the things the Bible gives us is, is there's a warning. There will be an end to time. On Wednesday night, we're starting a study of the book of Jude. It's one chapter. You say, Pastor, how long will that take? Longer than you think. <laughs> but part of what Jude is telling us, there's a, there's a game clock, and It's running. It's running. So the wicked have the opportunity to repent. And then we get this really harsh reality in verse 13. It's, it's not meant to scare people. It's just telling you how it is. Destruction will come to the unrepentant. How do things end for those who do not repent? Poorly. How do things end for those who repent? Really, really well. And then verses 14 through 16. The wicked conceive evil. They're pregnant with trouble. They give birth to lies. They dig a pit to trap others, and then they fall into it themselves. They make trouble, but it backfires on them. They plan violence for others, but it falls on their own heads. So what defines the wicked? How, how do you know the difference between the wicked and the misguided? The aim of the wicked is chaos and destruction. Hear me. The aim of the wicked is chaos and destruction. The enemy wants your marriage in chaos and destroyed. The enemy wants your family in chaos and destroyed. The enemy wants your mental state in chaos and destroyed. The enemy wants your emotional state in chaos and destroyed. The enemy wants your physical state in chaos and destroyed. That is what the enemy does. He tears stuff up. So what defines the wicked? Verse 14, they conceive evil. Their minds are set to destruction. Then they are pregnant with trouble. They birth ideas that simply cause trouble. And finally, they give birth to lies. There's no respect for the truth. And like David found with Cush the Benjaminite, lies are really hard to defend against because there's never been anything there. There's never been anything there. Lies are a powerful tool in the hands of the wicked. I think there's two kinds of wickedness. I, I think there are people who intentionally do evil, and I honestly think there are people who unwittingly do evil. The people who intentionally do evil, they know they're evil, they know the devil signs their paychecks. The unwitting, I think would be most surprised to find out who's signing their paychecks. The former are more often in the world the latter, frankly, are more often in the church. The former is always intentional. The latter is often unintentional. People aren't trying to cause chaos. They're not trying to cause destruction, but they do. But it's really interesting to me in this passage because it doesn't really matter what your motives are. The outcome of wickedness is the same. So what is the outcome of the wicked? It says in verse 15, they dig a pit to trap themselves, to trap others, but they fall into it. So whatever it is the wicked have devised for others, it will get them. And we can testify to that over and over. We've seen it happen over and over. Verse 16, they make trouble, but it backfires on them. They try to make trouble for others, but it backfires on them. And then next, they plan violence, but that violence lands on their heads. So everything the wicked dish out, God is going to flip it right back at them. The wicked do not end well in this world, and they fare even worse in the life to come. 
And then we get to the very last of our six big themes, offer thanksgiving. Verse 17, I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. It's not enough to just try your best to do everything right. Have you guys ever tried your best to do absolutely everything right, but you still said something stupid? Have you ever tried your best to do the right thing, but you still ended up doing something that was wrong? You see, the reason we can't rely on our own righteousness is because we can't always get it right. To use an old metaphor, in a fallen world, all of us have a missing spoke in our flywheel. We can get it right, maybe... 99% of the time, but there is this piece that's missing. There's this sin that's hardwired into a fallen world, and sometimes we stumble, even the best of us. And sometimes there is no right answer. You just got to make a decision to live with it. If God doesn't protect those he has called, none of us have a chance. We don't have a chance against the things that come of us from the outside, And we don't even have a chance against our own minds. Our own minds can destroy us. Our own emotions can destroy us. What God has given us here is a path out, a path to freedom. I'd like to invite you to join me in praying the seventh psalm. I've just turned the narrative into a prayer. Let that be our prayer today. Almighty God, if you don't rescue me, I don't have a chance. If I'm guilty, let me fall into the hands of my enemies. But if I'm innocent, arouse yourself and bring justice. Look into my heart, make your judgment, and publicly declare my innocence. In the meantime, stand between me and my accusers and save all whose hearts are true and right. Unleash your fury upon the wicked and the unrepentant. May they fall into the traps they have dug for others. You are my deliverer. I sing my praise to you and I lift up your name, amen. Let me tell you what happens to the wicked when they attack us. The attacks they throw at us end up being a boomerang. You guys, anybody old enough to remember when boomerangs were popular? Boomerangs, they said you throw them and they come back at you. I I used to throw them and I'd never see them again. (laughs) But boomerangs are something that you throw And they're just cut at a certain angle that if you throw them right, they eventually make their way back. The wicked will throw boomerangs at us. And then right about the time they think they have destroyed us, they will turn around and hold up their hands in victory. But that boomerang's coming right back at them. We don't have to live lives of revenge because God will avenge us. The actions of the wicked will fall upon the wicked. What they mean for our harm, they bring to themselves. But we, we, we can live in the protection of God. He protects our bodies, our minds, our emotions, and our eternal souls. Whatever it is you've got going in your life right now, God has it, and God has you. Repent of your sin. Turn to him. He wants nothing but good for us. As we stand, we're gonna just have a final act of worship. There'll be some folks available. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, we would love to do that. But what I'm gonna invite you to do is sort of uh, live out an old hymn lyric. The old gospel song said, take your burdens to the altar and leave them there. How often do we take our anxiety to God and we talk with God a while and we get done and we just pick our anxiety up and we take it back with us? Why don't you just, in your own heart and mind, even if you want to physically do that today, just bring that anxiety to God, leave it with him, leave it with him, and let's travel a path to freedom even in a fallen world. Would you stand as we sing together? Are you 
we get ready to leave this place, let's look at our scripture text once more for a portion of it to read together. I will thank the Lord because he is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. God is my shield, saving those whose hearts are true and right. Christ Church, go in peace. Have a great week. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.